Benvenuti a tutti, and welcome to another edition of Italian America Long Island. My name is Dave Anthony Sutta Ducati. Today, we're very happy to have a very special guest because he's one of the best accompanists for classical music on Long Island. He started studying piano at age 11, and now he has two degrees. And he operated for many years in New York City, a very successful voice coaching practice. And as I said before, he's one of the island's most respected and in-demand musicians. So welcome, Daniel Ragone. Daniel. It's good to be here. Oh, thank you, thank you so much for coming. We're so happy you could come. Well, I have to correct one thing right off the bat. Okay. I, I actually started at seven with piano. So yes, all three of us, my sisters as well, had to play piano. And was that because of your father or your mother's insistence? or? My father was particularly musical. He was a trombonist. He played in orchestras, including in opera. He played in the service. And they just had this idea that their kids should be exposed to music. Well, my father's brother was a musician, actually. But there wasn't a lot of, a lot of music, like in some families. But my parents just, it was a given, they bought a piano, we didn't play on some little instrument, they bought a really good piano, and they, and they encouraged us, I'm the only one who lasted, but they encouraged all three of us to study. But it was your uncle who was the pianist. Well that's where my big connection was with the piano. My uncle Nat, mm -hmm. my father's older brother, was a different kind of pianist for me, so we really, we appreciated each other. I could read anything, I could play anything, because I was classically trained. He had no classical or formal training, but he played by ear, and he could play anything in any key just by sitting at the piano and someone asking for a song. So I, was, I had a great deal of admiration for his talents, and he for mine. But we were very different kinds of pianists. Because my Uncle Nat is where I, he sent me a huge amount of wonderful opera recordings, LPs, when that was what most recordings were, um, when I was still pretty young, just because he wanted me to have them. So there was a lot of opera in his in his part of the family. And I know that you have a, an extensive knowledge of operatic music. I know that for a fact. I've been to your studio, of course, many times. And you have a wonderful uh, library of operatic materials, too. I have a lot of music, yes. Not just opera, m vocal music of all kinds. Well, classical vocal music. Classical vocal yes. music. Yes. So uh, let's get back to your heritage. Uh, your uh, family, who was the, the first to come over from Italy? Well, both my grandfathers came over around the same time. Um, the ladies followed. In my, in my mother's case, they were an arranged marriage. So when she came over, they didn't meet until the day they married. This was in the early part of the, of the previous century. Uh, my grandfather, I know for a fact that my paternal grandfather arrived in 1909. He met his wife future wife in, uh, in Italy, but she came here. So that made it necessary for him to come here because he fell in love with her. And that's what this book is, is a, is a diary of the, to the painful time that he was without her before, uh, before they got together in the States here, uh, a, a real record of it. So you said this book, would you show me that? What is this book that you're mentioning here? My grandfather, Ragone, G Giovanni, Giovanni Ragone, he was a very quiet man, very, very quiet man. Um, and he met my grandmother in Italy, and he started a diary that's actually to a friend, Giulio. This is the original. It's kind of fragile, but it's, he, and, and you see, it's beautifully written. He, had, he had no schooling. But the he self taught in terms so gorgeous. Yeah, he was self-taught. And the, the text of it is pretty simple. It starts out with him talking about this woman that he's fallen in love with. And he goes on to say he has to go to the States to be with her. And then this is the journey. He talks about arriving in the States. He talks about how nervous he is to meet her family. And then, then uh, most of it is just the happiness he is feeling to be with her once they've gotten back together. And it's, it's one of my prized possessions because my father gave it to me when I was pretty young. He said, you have to keep this and you have to make sure this gets preserved because it's a record of my father, he said, um, his, it, it, it gives you a chance to know him because he was a really quiet man and I, I didn't get to know him very well because he didn't say much. He was always smoking a cigar. He was very little. He gave me haircuts 
And I was always afraid of him because they were in the basement of their house. And he was probably too nervous about his English, so he never spoke to me. And I was surrounded by vats of wine in a dark room with pinchy scissors. And I told my mother, I told my mother later in life, I was scared to death. She said, why did you make me go down there? She said, we didn't know you were afraid. Your grandfather never said there was a problem. I said, he never said a word to me. So to read this was to get to know him in a way that I never could have gotten to know him as a child. So that's the one side. That's my father's father. Um, and my mother's father could not be a more different man. My mother's father was a peacock, kind of, some people would say a gigolo type. Very, very out there in the way he behaved. He owned a restaurant in Philadelphia. He called it, we called it a tap room. Bar and restaurant. He was always getting in trouble. He was always hanging out with his friends. He was always coming home and like bashing into our car, which was two houses away from his because he was a little high. My grandmother didn't even know half what went on with him. But he was a sweet man. He was a good man. He was always very good to all of us. Was he the Neapolitan? Yes, he was the Neapolitan. He and his his wife, who was unquestionably the grandparent I was closest to, um, my grandmother, my mom's mom, was the most reserved, unassuming person in the world. And something I have to say about my mother's side of the family, they did something that is so Italian. When, they, when my grandfather decided to move from the city to the suburbs, he picked out five houses, one for himself and his wife and four for his kids. And we grew up on the same block, four houses together, one down the hill of my mother, her parents, her sister and her two brothers, because he decided we were all going to move there at the same time and live on the same block. And that's how it was. And it was wonderful because we just would go over there constantly. My best friends were my cousins. And we would go over to my grandmother's, who had two kitchens, always was cooking. So very, very lovely people. I was really fortunate to know all four of my grandparents, but they were very different, very different. My m father's mother was the big matriarch, mm -hmm. the sort of the lady that sat there and gave the orders and told everyone what to do, told my mother how to name her kids, uh, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother's mother, as I said, was just like the sweetest, quietest person. So I got to know them all in different degrees, especially my mother's mother. Quite a cast of characters in your family. They run the gamut of, of uh, Italian types of people. Yes. It, it's really something that's really very fascinating. They do run the gamut. And we always spent Sundays in the city, Philadelphia, with my father's family because my mother's family was on the same block. Mm -hmm. So that was how we always spent time with them. We'd go into the city to spend time with them. Now, which of your grandparents or which of your relations would you say had the greatest influence on your upbringing? Well, I would, it would be hard for me to decide. My mother's sister, Angelina, was my godmother as well. She lived two houses away, and, I, and my, her son, Carmen, was my best friend. Mm -hmm. So she had a big influence on me just in the way I looked at life because she had such a sense of nobility about her and pride and she was she would never complain she would just cope and deal with things so I admired her for that I I, I guess that her, their mom my grandma Della Pola my mother's mom was probably the other one that really had a big influence on me the women and of course my father my parents both that's another whole story my parents are and were um, lovebirds they were just the happiest two people to know each other and we grew up in that atmosphere um, of two people who couldn't be apart. I mean, they wouldn't go buy milk without the other one. They were, they were, they were so close. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to say. I mean, there's really not, not a relative that I didn't like, wasn't in some way drawn to. So I'm very lucky, very lucky in that very sense. Very lucky, very lucky. Yeah, it was such a strong family. And when you were being raised, did you observe a lot of Italian uh, traditions in your home? Yes. I, I can honestly say that I, would, I grew up more Italian than American. For sure. For sure. It wasn't until I went away to college where I realized that. Mm -hmm. Because I, I went to Catholic school for 12 years, Boys Catholic High School, where everybody was Catholic, of course, and a lot of them were Italian or Irish. Right. So I, wasn't, I was still in a bubble, in a way, when I went away to college. But everything from the way we ate to the way we looked at family, to the way, the way we, the things we knew. My, my experience was so Italian Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, I would say 
that it wasn't until I spent some time in Italy where I realized just how Italian I grew up when I was around real Italians all the time, and I felt so comfortable. Right. Um, so I would have to say, yes, the, the way we grew up was very, in, in terms of just the accent on culture, which mm -hmm. my parents both believed in, family, almost to a smothering degree, almost to the degree where there's nobody but family, mm -hmm. and that, that that was like, an out, not an outrage, but it was a scandal when I went away to college for my master's because I went to the University of Illinois 800 miles away. Mm -hmm. My parents moved me into my place and drove out there frequently to bring me food and spend time with me. So it was all, we were never far apart even though I went away and stuff, so the, the, the idea of close family was really, really so deeply embedded in my sisters and me. Right. Now, you mentioned uh, going to Italy. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your trip? You went to Rome, I believe? Yes. I spent a week in Rome. It was a really life-changing moment because I think I came to understand just how much of me and, and my, my worldview and just my way of relating to people had to do with being Italian. I, because I suddenly felt I understood my family better and my way of looking at things. And it just, it's kind of hard to articulate, but I think it has to do with what the Italians call the, the, the bella figura, mm -hmm. the two ways of, of dealing with the world, what you present to the outside world, and what you are when you're with your own family, quiet indoors, or not quiet, maybe. I saw all of these Italians around me just seemed so polite and reserved and proper. And that was like the way my family always was, even though I saw a lot of Italian Americans that didn't fit that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that Italian people are. They're very proper. They're very reserved. They're very polite, of course. And I always had a problem with understanding how other people were so sort of coarse and in your face. I'm, in ways that my family would have, my father and mother would have said, that's just, that's not the way you behave, you know. It, what you do in the house is among us. But you don't go out and show yourself that way. And I, I came to understand this whole idea there's a great book called The Italians by uh, Luigi Barzini. I don't know if you know the book. Everyone should read it if it's Italian. I don't even know if it's still in print. I read it in college because I took an Italian culture course. And one of the things that stuck with me is he said, Italian is a shame-based culture. These are people who feel shame easily. These are people who become proud because they feel shame. These are people who care how things look. And I went to Italy and I thought, look, at everybody around me is proud of how they're walking, how they look, what, how they're... And I understood that. That's that quality. And I didn't really understand it fully or in that visceral way until I went and spent some time. It was one of the best weeks of my life, that week in Rome. I just, I fell in love with Rome. I really did. But more importantly, I became to understand myself and my family better from the experience. Yeah, so we have a lot of images like uh, the Jersey Shore type, yes. Guido type mm -hmm. of Italian, and that's really not very accurate. It's not. It's not at all. Italians are a, a much more cultured people as a race, and uh, their, their values are very high, and they have a lot of pride. That's right. And, and they're a lot more cultured and genteel than, than people really uh, have come to believe in the United States. I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that, if I could say so. Um, for one thing, Italians tend to be comfortable in their own skin and express themselves pretty easily and emotionally pretty grounded. So, of course, people come in varieties. And there are those people who maybe came from more modest backgrounds, who don't have as much education, whatever you want to call it. So, yes, there are, unfortunately, in our culture and in our, in, in our uh, especially our popular culture, they're the more interesting ones to portray, the mob ones. You know, the, the typical Italian who's good-looking, friendly, easygoing, a lot of fun, not too smart, and, you know, might get into trouble. And that's what we get, and it bothers me a lot because it would be a lot more boring to have an Italian family where the doctor is the father or a lawyer is the, fa the father, and you have people, professionals, and you have young people behaving like serious individuals who want to go to college rather than just a bunch of big maths. So it, it is hard to take for me a little bit, but and my father used to say it. My father wouldn't even go see the movie The Godfather. 
He just, he, he just said because he, he had a problem with it. It's a terrible said, thing to, to just see that one side of the Italian personality. And we, we must remember Italy, some of the greatest culture, the greatest art, the greatest music, yes. and the greatest engineering. Style. Great styles. Everything. Name it. Everything has come out of that, and it, it comes from someplace different. It's not uh, the, the criminal thing. But I guess, being Italian, we should be proud that Italians have the greatest criminals, too. I mean, as my mother, something to be proud of. As my mother likes to say, we're very entertaining people. <laughs> and the most entertaining among us are unfortunately not necessarily the highest in yes, terms of quality. That's true. That's so true. we have to deal with that. So you know? now, you're, you're one side of your family, your grandfather came over here for love, yes. following his lady love. Uh, your other side, your other grandfather, why did they come? Because I know there was a great period of Italian immigration because I know uh, my family in Basilicat, uh, they were so poor. He had to rent the space in a barn for his family. So when he had the opportunity to come to the United States, he did. Was that something that was similar with your other side? So basically, and yes, they were pretty poor, mm -hmm. but their families were already here, or other relatives. And they knew the, each other? No. The fam the fa they were paisans, as it were. Oh, it they was. were from the same town from over there, and in Philadelphia, you were, you were in a neighborhood with, with your own people from right. the old country. Right. So this arrangement was made through people who knew each other from the old country. And, and said, well, we've got a daughter, we've got a son, bring them over, no, not a relative. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it wasn't their parents. So they were arranged to be brought over and sent over and married. It, it is amazing. Because one, the one opened a grocery store, my, my father's father, my mother's father opened a restaurant. These people came here, they didn't speak any English, they, had, they never had a handout of any kind, they were successful in what they did. So that was their reasons, that's how it happened with them as opposed to my other grandfather who met his bride there and she so came here. If you were going to go back to Italy, where would you like to go? Well, believe it or not, I don't have that much of an interest in going necessarily to the towns where my grandparents came from. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the cultural capitals. I, I, gotta go to, I have to go to Florence. I have to go to Florence. And of course I have to go to Venice, just because there's only one Venice. Um, you know, I don't really care. I just want to be in Italy again, because wherever you go in Italy, you're, you're surrounded by beauty and lovely people and great food. I have to get to Florence. I have to get to Florence. When I spent a week in Rome, because I wanted to absorb Rome and not just do a quick visit of the Vatican and then leave, I literally stayed down the street from the Vatican, and I went every day to St. Peter's and looked at the Pietà, and just, it was quiet, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was just wonderful, the whole experience, the art. Just for the art, I want to be back there again. Because everything is art in Italy. Everything. You don't have to go to a museum. No. no. You, don't, you don't even have to go to a church, which, is, which are like museums. It's just, just everywhere. And obviously, I have an artistic sensibility, which is something else, which I found out because my parents were smart enough to encourage me to learn music, because that's where I yeah. ended up. Well, the thing that struck me about Florence, when we were there, you go to Signoria Square, right? and they have, I, I would call it an arcade. It's an open air arcade. It has a roof and right. uh, sort of like a loggia uh, on a building. And in there are some of the greatest statues that you've ever seen. They're in every textbook. And this is in an open public square. And you right. wonder, nobody has spray painted these or defaced them. They have a, a duplicate of the Statue of David in front of the, the, right. the building there. Nothing is defaced. Everything is, is preserved. Uh, and you get the feeling that people really value, value these, these works of art. And of course you see that the real statue of David is just a, an amazing, amazing experience for anyone. It has, uh, on me, it had such an emotional impact to see this statue. Uh, it, it, it's just an amazing thing. And then for us, when we went to Venice, uh, my wife didn't particularly care for it. But I have to say, I thought it was the most fantastic place in the world. The buildings, the culture, uh, the uh, Palazzo Ducale is one of the most magnificent uh, buildings I've ever seen. Uh, to go in there, and it's, it's all art, just as you said. It's all covered with this magnificent art. 
great, just a, a wonderful thing. But now to shift gears, how about your music career now? Tell us a little bit about that. First of all, I went, I got my first degree in piano performance. I didn't really know what to major in when I went to college. Today, kids are forced almost unnaturally to have, know what they're going to major in by the time they're junior year of high school. It's ridiculous, I think. I knew I was going to go to college, and by the way, there is a double standard there because in my family, the women of that generation, none, neither my sisters did not go to college. It was just I was going to go to college. Right. I went to college, and I, even though I had my strengths in high school because I was an honor student, I was always a whiz at math. I didn't really have a subject or an area that I wanted to pursue, so I, I was so familiar with the piano. So I told my parents, I'm going to major in music. And my father, who was a practical man, tried to talk me into doing something a little more practical and actually suggested maybe you should be a business major. And I took one accounting course and I hated it so much and I told him, no, it's not going to happen, I'm not going to be a business major. And let me stay with music. Years later, he was very pleased that I had stayed with music. So as a piano major, I mean, just the whole world opened up to me because I'd always played, but all of a sudden I was taking music courses, I was hearing symphonies, I was hearing music that I didn't know existed and immediately spoke to me. In fact, on the way over here today, I was listening to a, a, a CD in the car that reminded me of my college years because that's when I first heard it and found it so incredible. So I was really, like, overwhelmed mm -hmm. with the classics, with Beethoven and the symphony. Early on, I got to know a singer who we became friends. She was from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I was from Philadelphia. She's, we're still good friends. And I played for her. I got in the habit of accompanying her. Amazing voice, amazing person. I really, I, I can say that she's one of the reasons I decided to switch my emphasis to vocal music. So I went, I got my degree in piano, and then uh, I, the school was visited by a very famous accompanist. Luciano Pavarotti's accompanist, John Mustman, came to visit and he did a master class, and I played for her in the master class. This is one of those moments where someone on the faculty at Penn State said to me, you have to meet him. We met, he heard my playing, he invited me to get a master's with him, invited me on scholarship, I got an assistantship, I went to Illinois to get my master's, and then it was all vocal music, and I was in heaven. It was all vocal music, I had, so many, I had a stable of singers for the two years I was there, who I was responsible for. That prepared me to go to New York and to know what, what constitutes a vocal coach. Mm -hmm. So when I moved to the city, right after I left college, I set up a studio and I started building a studio of singers, of, of working singers. And that went on for almost 30 years before I left the city. And I, and I loved it. It was a great time in my life. I loved the city. I had just great years for me. It's evolved. Of course, I work with singers of all ages, mm -hmm. mostly classic. But I mean, obviously, on Long Island, I, I branch out a little more, and there's a lot of musical theater. And I love that. I've, I've met all these singers who love singing and have their own reasons for singing, but especially the teenage thing. I didn't think I'd ever want to work with teenagers. Turns out I'm, I have a great connection with teenagers. Um, so now my music is it, it, it's just had a whole new life. Serious singers on Long Island generally have to go into New York to get good coaching. Mm -hmm. They have me here now because I'm a New York coach who moved here mm -hmm. and I have something that they don't find just anywhere so that word is out and I'm loving I'm, I, I'm so happy with my work here. In fact, I'm so happy with it that I have to tear it down a little bit. So now you, you also concerts. participate in concerts and you organize concerts. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the performing side of your career? I've always performed. I stopped performing as a pianist when I got involved with as a solo pianist, uh, mm -hmm. when I got involved with singers, because it's a whole, it's a completely different art. Right. Even though I like to keep my fingers in shape, but I've always been pretty good at performing. I like performing. I enjoy performing, and I like partnership. Singing is collaboration. You know, it's 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 not just what you do by yourself. It's it's got this this connection with mm -hmm. another person, mm -hmm. and eventually, I got two a music series going one on the South Shore, one on the North Shore, where I do concerts three or four times a year that I bring, that the church presents. It's a music series, and we, we are trying, that's the other thing about my mission here. I'm bringing music of a certain kind to certain Long Islanders who are not familiar with it. New York City has no shortage of people who know opera, know the classics, and no shortage of good vocal coaches. Here I feel I really, if I do it right, can introduce so many people to something that they don't know about. 
I have a number of libraries that always ask me back to bring special concerts. In fact, Sachem Library, where I have a good relationship with them, they want me next. They want me already in October of 19 to do an Italian heritage program. So I'll bring together some people and do Italian, all Italian music. So I have these series, and I do. Well, people hire me out for private recitals as well. Yeah, I have one coming up, which you know about, with a very good Italian American singer, uh, Francesca. So I do a lot of performing, probably a dozen concerts a year, which is a lot, because as a pianist, I have to prepare for the concerts along with do my studio work. Are there any uh, performances that stand out in your mind as uh, very memorable? Yes, yes. Usually the most memorable ones are with artists who are elevated in what they do. One in particular at the Metropolitan Opera that I played for because a friend who worked there died and I was asked to, to play in his memorial. Lots of very, very very distinguished people and it was a beautiful event. I got to play Beethoven. I didn't even play vocal music. That was very memorable for me way, way many years back. But for me personally, chamber music, I don't get to do it very often. I love chamber music. I did a chamber music concert recently with, uh, with a violinist and a French horn player and that was especially rewarding because I've gotten away from that music. Delicious, my group, the three ladies that I do these concerts with, they're a lot of fun. Two sopranos and a mezzo. I especially love my concerts with them. Mm -hmm. We do everything from American songbook to opera to musical theater. Those are especially enjoyed. If, it's, if we have time, I would like to share just one other thing about my certainly, family. Certainly. Since we started with my family. Yes. I, didn't, I didn't speak much about my parents, um, but I spoke more about my grandparents. And I had the good fortune of growing up, my sisters and I had the good fortune of growing up in a house with two people who had such love and respect for each other that the joke in college was that, you know, I was not from a dysfunctional family, so I was some kind of freak. But I really, <laughs> I was not from a dysfunctional family, as boring as that is for some people. And I just will never, ever forget how my parents treated each other and how obsessed they were with treating the three of us fairly. And I just wanted to add that because it has made such a difference in the way I look at life. People say to me in my work all the time, you're so fair. You're always worried about being fair. I said, got it from my parents. It's a good thing. Kindness and fairness. And I think that's the best tribute I could pay to my parents because they did us a great service by bringing us up that way. Well, God bless them. God bless you, Daniel, for being such a wonderful son, too. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. I've enjoyed it's this a lot. really, really very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.